This warehouse in Ithaca, New York, contains the world's largest collection of consumer products. You can find one of almost everything on these shelves, including over 50,000 failures. They were researched, planned, and launched by some of the world's smartest corporations. Many successful companies have incurred huge losses when they brought out new products, entered new markets, or formed new alliances. Why do businesses so often stumble when they enter new territory? Well, there's a lot of reasons why smart, experienced companies get into trouble, and a lot of it has to do with the very things that made them successful to begin with. They develop a set of ground rules, they develop a set of, of procedures for handling businesses that they already know, and the difficulty is that a lot of times changing circumstances or a new business opportunity isn't going to work using those old rules. What happens is when companies start down a new path, they don't have the facts. Uh, the assumptions that they make get uh, converted into facts in their minds and they proceed as if they were facts and lose a whole host of, uh, of dollars by uh, not checking their assumptions. New ventures are risky. Failure comes with the territory. But the cost of failure can be cut if planners use the right tools. Discovery-driven planning is really an approach to undertaking situations that have a lot of uncertainty in them. Trying to uh, create a working mental model of that system and essentially setting forth your assumptions so that they can be tested. And discovery-driven planning is in essence a plan to learn to convert your assumptions into facts and you try to learn ahead of making major investments. Even the world's most successful companies can get into trouble if they don't recognize the assumptions buried in their plans. In 1992, the Walt Disney Company opened Euro Disney outside of Paris. Disney was already the world's most successful theme park operator. Mickey and his friends had earned billions for the company at parks in the USA and Japan. Euro Disney would extend the successful formula to a new market. Half of revenue would come from admissions, the other half from food, merchandise, and hotels. By 1993, Euro Disney had reached its target of nearly a million visitors a month, but the park was operating in the red. What went wrong? there are a, a series of decisions that they made which ended up costing them enormous amounts of money and a lot of public credibility. Uh, for example, they assumed that um, the, the French and European populations that were coming to the parks would behave in the parks as Americans do. The park's restaurants were designed for people to eat quickly and move on. Now, Europeans sit down and they have a meal. They don't graze all day as the Americans and Japanese did in the theme parks in Japan and the United States. So uh, they went forward and designed whole restaurants and the entire food distribution system in that theme park on the basis of, of uh, uh, eating behavior that the uh, Europeans simply don't follow. Every day at noon, the restaurants were jammed with hungry people who couldn't get seated. Many left the park to eat. Planners assumed an average hotel stay of four nights. But Euro Disney opened with only 15 rides, compared to 45 at Disney World. Visitors could do all of Euro Disney's rides in a day, and stayed only two nights. Visitors also spent less than the company expected on souvenirs. When Europeans buy things in a gift shop, not only do they buy less than Americans do, they're not so much into the Mickey Mouse hats and that kind of thing, they tend to buy the lower margin items. Disney has begun to adapt the park for European tastes. But what seemed at first like a simple extension of a successful formula turned out to present some surprising problems for one of the world's most successful companies. 
point is that when you're doing something new, you can't treat it the way that you can something you know a great deal about. Uh, the unexpected will happen, and we can either learn from the unexpected, plan to learn, or we can proceed as though we were right and end up with a major disappointment on our hands. One company in Philadelphia is about to embark on a new venture using discovery-driven planning. In 1994, Edwin Thompson founded Pharmaceutical Manufacturing Research Services. Their clients are some of the world's largest drug companies. After a year in business, the company is doing well by providing drug formulation, prototyping, and testing services. But now, Thompson wants to expand into new areas. Our job is to be able to give you the best product with the best delivery at the best price. Thompson meets often with prospective clients. Um, if you need it, I can give you an answer right now today, whether I can afford it or not, whether I can put it in for you, and I can tell you how fast we can do it. And if it's important, we'll take off our coat and go start it in an hour. Today, Thompson is trying to win a new kind of business, large-scale commercial manufacturing. Uh, we, are you doing commercial manufacturing for people? I'm not today. But drug companies have been reluctant to outsource production of their core products. You know, we don't want to give you our crown jewel product uh, and have you manufacture it because what happens if, if you don't know how to do that and we put at risk, say, a $500 million product? This is a... 10 cubic foot decomb blender. To reassure prospective clients that he can perform to their standards, Thompson must maintain rigorous quality control. He works to surpass government cleanliness requirements. The building's air and water supply systems are monitored daily, and Thompson depends on his hand-picked, highly skilled staff to maintain quality. So we need to get a baseline, just one baseline, relatively quick and figure out what's happening. And then I'll know again Monday when I take them. But quality control isn't the only hurdle PMRS must overcome if it is to break into the commercial market. Fluid bed. The other is technology. The company doesn't own the costly machines required for commercial scale output. And Thompson isn't sure if he can generate enough business to justify the investment. The question is, should we be in that business or not? We envisioned being in that business. We wanted to be in that business. But as you live it and you get a hold of all the variables and all the influences that take place in there, you come back and reevaluate again. Should we? Are we more knowledgeable now? And is the answer the same as when we originally started? <laughs> Today, Thompson has invited Ian McMillan and Rita McGrath to apply the tools of discovery-driven planning to his business idea. And, and that is, I've always had a, a great interest in going to commercial-scale manufacturing. I think it has enormous potential. Mm -hmm. and, and if I can pilot and do one, I'd like to do two, three, four, five on up. To set up a pilot plant, Thompson will have to invest $7 million in equipment and space. When you want to undertake a discovery-driven plan, what you really have to do is put together four major documents. Let's, let's illustrate it then. McMillan and McGrath start by sketching out the broad outlines of the business using the first document, the reverse income statement. The reverse income statement says, I'm not going to start a new venture unless I can guarantee to myself a certain amount of profits. You then ask yourself, how many costs am I allowed to have in order to make those profits, and how much revenue must I generate in order to be able to carry those costs and get those profits. You, you, you require a return on asset of, what do you say, 30%? 30%. Okay, that's neat. So that means uh, if you've got assets of about $7 million, then you you're required... At sorry? You're looking at 2.1 million. 2.1. Of uh, 2.1 mil. So the difference between a discovery-driven planning reverse income statement and a conventional plan is you start with profits and profitability, and then you go to what you must sell. In a conventional plan, you normally start with what you expect your revenues to be, what you expect your cost to be, and if you're lucky, you'll get profits at the end. Your sales revenues should be uh, 2.1 divided by 0.5, which sort of often comes to about $4 million. 
So Thompson's business needs to generate $4 million to ensure the needed profits. But what will it take to generate that $4 million? The next step in discovery-driven planning is to lay out all the activities needed to run the venture. The second document takes this profitability that you must make and the revenues that are required in order to achieve it and puts together what we call an operations spec. Now the operations specification is a very detailed statement of the actual activities that the firm must carry out in order for this venture to succeed and in order to get the profit. Now here we have the operations spec. Now how, how do you price? How do you capture revenues from these tablets? We charge, we charge either as a process or a per tablet price to our, to our clients. Two to three cents a tablet. Manufacturing fee of, shall we say three cents a tablet? Three cents, okay. three cents per tablet. That's, that's At three cents a tablet, the new business will need to make 140 million tablets a year. Okay, so what this starts to do is, is give you very rapidly a sense of, a lot of you know, what the size and scope is of the business. And, and so, you know, we know nothing about this business, but does 140 million sound like a hell of a lot of tablets? No, what, what, what our problem in this business is, is not a capacity issue, but it's uh, a number of clients issue. You're gonna get at most 50 million tablets from a customer, maybe ranging and growing to 100 million, but yeah. the first couple of years, you're gonna get 50 million tablets out of any one customer. And that kind of says to you that uh, you gotta go out there for this business and, and get at least three customers. Now, what we have here is, a, is, is, is an assumption. Can Thompson get three customers to order 50 million tablets each? It's one of many implicit assumptions in his plan. You, you need to document your assumptions and then find ways of testing them before you go into the hole for $3.3 million. Mm -hmm. One of the most important things about discovery-driven planning is this formal discipline of sitting down and articulating and writing down the assumptions. So the next document is your sort of uh, assumption checklist. There are four so far that seem to me to be worth, worth some testing. There's a question of what the return on sales really is. Um, Every assumption about the business must be examined and written down. One of Thompson's assumptions is that his new plant will meet the rigorous government specifications for pharmaceutical factories. Is that a... It's a very big assumption. Yeah. It's, a, it's a very high-risk, big assumption. Yeah. Now, once you've put down those assumptions, the next step is to sort of say what major events, what major milestone events will unfold as this venture unfolds. Things like uh, getting my first order, um, having my first production run. In which case, you, the first thing you'd need to get is the certification, because nothing happens until that business, there's no business happening until you're certified. And um, you now start to ask yourself the question, as I look at each one of these milestones, which of the assumptions that I've made are going to be tested? This pilot plant operation, to me, would be a really good place to start because here's where you're going to test assumptions about who the customers are, why they buy. At every milestone, assumptions will be tested against experience. As problems get revealed, the risks of moving forward become clear. The new data is fed back to update the other documents. The plan gets revised. One of Thompson's milestones will be finding staff. And if so much of what makes this business powerful depends upon know-how and depends upon new experienced, talented people, we have to make sure that we, we can get enough of those to support this effort as it goes forward. So what you're telling me is that, that I may have a, a limited upside based on how fast I can staff, yeah. train, and, and bring people in. And one of the most difficult things you do is to hire the best people. And you're in an interesting paradox because what's keeping others out of the business is the fact that it's so tough. But that may also limit the extent to which you can expand. Based on today's session, Thompson will decide to go ahead with his pilot plan. But he now recognizes there may be limits to his company's ability to grow. You may have the greatest intentions of expanding your business to, to whatever number. The reality is that, that we just may not be able to do that and do it well, and it could jeopardize the whole business. Discovery-driven planning is a useful tool for any uncertain undertaking, what some managers call white-knuckle projects. The four documents, the reverse income statement, 
the operation specification, the assumption checklist, and the milestone chart help ensure that managers articulate what they don't know and continue to learn throughout the planning process. These tools may seem like common sense, but they're not as commonly practiced as managers may think. Managers genuinely believe that they plan this way. They genuinely believe, with all sincerity, that there's, there's something here that they're already doing. And when you examine what they actually do, minute by minute, day by day, week by week, these concepts simply aren't there. So it's not rocket science. Discovery-driven planning is discipline. And, and it's the, this is the tough part of it. People really have to be disciplined. And the most difficult part of it is the creativity that is required to sit down and say to yourself, before I spend a lot of money, can I absolutely find a way of testing certain assumptions? 